Um, there, there is a small amount of actual audience participation and they've just locked the door. Um, so you're all stuck in the room now, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. And um, I lied, it's not really locked. <laughs> Come on in. You're not, you're not late. I haven't started yet. <laughs> no, you're not late, I promise. Um, but I will get started in uh, about two minutes. And there is a small amount of having to talk to other people, which I know is going to be horrendous for some of you. Um, so if you're not a talking kind of person, please do make sure that you have your digital device open and ready to tweet, which I realize will be a lot more accessible uh, for some of you. And I don't have a hashtag for the talk, so you could just put it on the DrupalCon hashtag. Um, I don't think it'll be too scary, though. So if you want to, you don't have to come towards me, that's fine. Um, but if you want to, <laughs> if you want to uh, move forward or back so that you're sort of vaguely sitting near someone else, um, <laughs> again, you don't, you don't have to. If you want to be on Twitter instead, that's completely fine. <laughs> I love when I say audience participation and then some people are like, nope, I'm out, and they just walk out of the room. It's okay, the recording will be here for you later when you're ready for it. <laughs> um, I think it's okay if I start about 20 seconds early. I, I think I'm all right with this. I know that everyone's like standing outside just waiting to rush the room, but I think we're good. Um, so this, this talk came about uh, because in part, um, Emma convinced me to, um, tell the story that I had told to her about how I had found what is now, for me, quite meaningful em employment. There are definitely challenges with my job, and I'll tell you who I work for in a minute, so you'll perhaps um, want to remember that statement of there are challenges. Um, but it's, it's been a pretty interesting journey for me, and I hope that for some of you it will be useful, relevant, um, and for some of you it may just be story time where you get to hear about the different kinds of jobs that I've had in the last 20 years, about 15 of which has been with Drupal. Um, so, more specifically, uh, I have been around since the days of Drupal, gosh, three, four in that range, so quite a long time in Drupal speak. Um, it worked, at the time I was working for uh, local government and or was a, a contractor sort of around that time. Um, since then, I've worked for in-house development teams for uh, agencies, I've worked for Phase 2, I've worked for Lullabot, although I was on the education side of things, so more specifically Drupalize me, and have also now, uh, maybe the right way is to say it, landed a job working for the United Nations, where I work as a development manager and a project manager for uh, within digital services for the Office uh, for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. So the challenging part of my job is that I deal with professional disaster responders and all of the um, heartache that comes with paying attention to the work that you're doing in terms of how that impacts the field. Um, for me, it has been a really interesting uh, journey. We are using Drupal in-house. I manage, we probably have about seven or eight Drupal projects that we host, and then there's also a combination of uh, Python, some straight PHP websites, what am I forgetting? There's another platform in there. Ooh, don't tell anyone. Node, that's the other one that we host. <laughs> um, and it, so it's a range of different products and um, effectively, we, so the digital services team acts as a mini in-house agency, but there's not time cards associated. It doesn't have the same sort of regular or the typical billing cycle that you would think of uh, in terms of doing agency work and we have a much longer term relationship with our clients because they're all within our organization. So similar to some of the work that I was doing, but a little bit, a little bit of a twist. Now, I, <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing to do to everyone, but what I would really like for you to do is just with the folks around you or perhaps on Twitter if you're not completely comfortable talking to strangers, which I completely understand and respect, do you know right now what it is, and so this is sort of like the before and after, do you know what it is right now that you are doing when you are most happy? So with the, with the folks next to you, give a bit of an introduction, you may already know them, 
and uh, maybe you've seen or heard about the term flow, like what is it that you're doing, let's say at your computer, when you are filled with the most joy, and then we'll, we'll sort of unpack a little bit of that um, as the presentation sort of unfolds. And then the other thing, if you have no idea and you actually hate doing Drupal, that's okay, I understand that too. We all have those moments. Today might be that moment for you. Uh, <laughs> What is your other passion in life? So we'll assume that Drupal is your number one passion, which may or may not be the case, but we'll make that assumption. Um, so what is sort of your, your outside world or sort of when you're, not, when you're not doing Drupal, what is it? So for me, it would be sewing or running are my two sort of outside passions. So I'll give you sort of 30 seconds right now to sort of just do a quick introduction. And at the computer, what are you doing when you are most happy? And then the second one, what, what's your secondary source of joy? Go ahead. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut you short on this one. But what I saw out there was a lot of happy faces, which is good, because initially what I saw was a lot of faces sort of looking at me blankly thinking, I have no idea what brings me joy. So for some of you, the social aspect of it is what brings you joy, because as soon as you were able to talk to someone else, you were able to start sort of thinking about what it was that, that you actually love doing. There's a few words sort of up behind me that maybe you would have um, exchanged with one another in terms of building or refactoring, being social or working alone. Um, do, you, do you like optimizing code? Do you like generating new code? You know, there's lots of different things that you could have said. And it's always, for me, a bit fun to see the, the reaction when someone else sort of like, there's people out there who actually enjoy refactoring. And, and the look on someone's face, you're like, really, those people exist? Yes, I have met them. They exist in the wild. I know that they're out there. Um, and it's sort of, you know, there's these different ways of thinking, and I'm going to sort of wrap a lot of this presentation. I know you really want to take a picture. The slides are already li online. I promise it'll be all right. There's an article that I read or a, a presentation that I watched actually a couple of years ago that broke um, ways of thinking about problems into three types of people. And this, um, there's a lot of the metaphor that doesn't really work for what we're going to do, but I think it's a good one. So we're going to talk about pioneers, settlers, and town planners. And this is um, originally a, a blog post by Simon Wardley, who's um, done a lot with OSCON. So if you do a search for uh, OSCON and Simon Wardley, you'll find some really interesting things that he's also talked about. And he basically says that there's three types of very brilliant people who do really, really important work. You've got the pioneers who are going to build something that is a prototype. It's not even a product. They come up with these outlandish ideas that you would never want to actually use. They probably, their code doesn't work a lot of the time, but they're really innovative and interesting ideas that they're going to bring to the table. The next one is the uh, settler. And what the settler does is they take this prototype and they turn it into an actual usable MVP or product, something you might want to, you know, now you're getting into the beta phase of things. You can handle low volume traffic. You can actually start having users interact with it. And they, they serve a really important purpose. I mean, at this point, you're starting to perhaps make money off of that initial prototype. And you are, you're able to, to bring some reliability to it. And then finally, you've got the, the town planners at the end of things. The town planners take that initial website and they scale it up into something absolutely massive. And they are able to, at that point, so if, if you think about, you know, I can put an, a, a video on my website, 
but if I want to be Netflix, I don't want everyone coming to my website. So that's the scaling idea of you have this initial platform that you then want to make bigger. So roughly speaking, you're going to have the pioneers as the people who invent, the settlers as the people who refactor, and the town planners as the people who are going to scale. Now, there's all kinds of ways that this doesn't quite work in the real world, but think of it in that way for this one. So within those three categories, you may sort of initially, you know, you may start to think about which of those three you are, and then start thinking about how you experience work, and think about whether or not you are fighting with what the work is trying to do or what your employer is trying to do in terms of their core business and what you are most interested in. Ultimately, employers can also be pioneers, settlers, and town planners. And there's also, of course, different points of the project where you, know, you, may, you may have early on in the development of a product where something is going to be um, sort of on the the innovative side of things, and then maybe it's going to be very innovative, again, at the scaling side when you start to think about bigger infrastructure and actually making it work for millions of people instead of your cat and your dog. So now we need to start thinking about these types of employers. And the other question that I've asked myself sort of over and over again is, how is it that I've had all of these different jobs in the last 20 years, and, and sort of what do they have in common? And I've got some things in terms of I really like three-month projects. That's my, my window or my attention span for excitement. And even in the place that I'm in right now, even though I'm in an in-house software developer, effectively, it's still project-based. And I still have multiple teams that I'm supporting. And we still have projects that are about three months long where we add new features and then basically set that site up for maintenance mode where it's only getting bug fixes and only getting small um, tweaks along the way. So I've been self-employed agency work in terms of uh, working for phase two, um, and also basically agency work as my own um, self-employed person. And then the in-house development was working for a couple of different, and actually all of my in-house agency work has been for government or pseudo-government. And then finally the in-house combination, which is where I am right now, which is effectively an agency inside a large organization. I've found that in, especially at Drupal cons and at Drupal camps, I found that there's this affinity for uh, Drupal agencies, and that's that's who we see out in on the exhibit hall. You know, that, those are the companies that we think about working for. Those are the ones that we see. And yet, of the folks who are here, I'm going to I'm not going to do a show of hands because you might prove me wrong, <laughs> but I'm going to guess that a percentage of you are not actually working for Drupal agencies. And certainly, if we were to go into the wider audience of who's here, it's there's not enough Drupal agency work for everyone to actually be working at an agency. So we're likely to find schools, libraries, government, things that are perhaps someone's secondary passion, and they're not necessarily building software for the sake of software. So then we, then we start to look at, okay, if there's different kinds of agencies, there's also different types of industries that we can work in. And as I was saying, you, know, you can be producing technology for the sake of technology, which is a lot of the folks who are on that trade floor are building technology for other technologists to consume in their day job. Then we have users of technology, which is the government, the schools, the think about all the folks you've built websites for if you do agency work right now. And then ultimately combining that with your passion. So if you come back to, you know, what was your secondary hobby? Um, it's like, my dream job might actually be working for Strava, might actually be, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways that you can think about. And it sort of as a, as a graduate with a second degree or a second major rather in political science, for me to be always coming back to government makes a lot of sense in terms of my second passion. My, um, first passion isn't necessarily technology, it's more that I hate bad websites and so want to make them better. <laughs> you know, that sort of refactoring experience and they, those people do exist in the wild, like, yeah, I want to make it better for people. I want this experience to be really, really wonderful or at least suck a little bit less. Um, so if you think about your secondary passion and you pair it with, um, with that sort of, are you a pioneer, are you an inventor, a refactorer or a scaler? I don't even know if these are words, but let's think of it that way. Then we can sort of match those up and find the job that's going to be right for you. Now, this next session, section rather is cheeky, maybe a little bit cheeky, because it's really a primer on reading job advertisements. 
And I have found that most of them are really poorly written. Um, so it, it may seem a little bit unfair, but we'll see if I can match them up, kind of. So the, the first set, and these are, you know, <laughs> these are pulled from real job adverts on the internet. You can tell because of that first sentence. Uh, so the inventor friendly, if you're thinking about keywords when you're reading a job description that might suit you, you will need, I, and I have to read this, I, this is one of those things where I can't just paraphrase, you will need to efficiently execute on business priorities and designs in an agile framework. So there's a couple of keywords for he, me here. One is that they haven't actually named what the Agile framework is. And uh, in my experience, Agile is a code word for I didn't feel like planning and I'm going to change my mind regularly. I really like the Agile manifesto and I um, don't particularly have a single framework that I use. But for the scale of this company, for this, where this job posting was, this is code for we're going to change our mind a lot. So if you really like sort of crafting these exceptional software experiences that are going to take time and energy to do the user research, to think about what it is that you need to build, to be able to test the implementation with the users, to iterate over time, this, this is maybe not quite going to be a good job for you. But if you love to invent stuff and you love to just sort of put things out there and see if it works and put things out there and see if it works on a completely different project, this one may be a good match for you. Uh, second, the second one, come prepared to work in a fast-paced environment. Um, that one may just be code word for we don't know how to stop at the end of the day, but again, I sort of, I think it's not a, it doesn't have the language of we, we take the time to stop and think about what we do. So let's, let's contrast it and why I think it's, a, you know, they're a different set of keywords. Because this one is um, more on the, the continuous, it's not, it's not about speed so much as iteration. So continuously improve operational processes and procedures, sorry my Canadian's coming out here, uh, development and support of, so that support word to me implies refactoring, because if you are responsible for a product long term, you're going to be thinking about how you can change that product to actually meet the needs of the users who are experiencing problems. So slightly different if we go, if I can figure it backwards, yeah, slightly different from fast paced or Focus on the business priorities, which is not necessarily the user needs. Um, agile framework, a slightly different language on these ones. And then scaling. Scaling was a bit tricky for me to find examples of the language that I would expect. And for the most part, I found it in operations, where it was more on uh, the, where you have a division between what the developers done, have done and then what the operations team is responsible for in terms of making sure it stays upright in production. Uh, but in these cases, I was mostly finding things around performance and scalability as being the keywords that, that you may look for in a job description if that's of interest to you. Um, the big one, I think, I don't know, like, it's maybe an unfair heading, but the big one for me was uh, how do you personally like to work? So in terms of, uh, I work on a distributed team and it is distributed by design, um, being an operations team in terms of keeping the web servers online we don't all want to be sat in the same place because we don't want to do night shifts. And so we've got a team, part of the team is in Australia, part in Romania, and then I'm in the UK. So the, the culture that we have in our uh, digital space needs to be very aware of time zones. And so we try to not have an interrupt culture that results in someone being pinged at two o'clock in the morning with an expectation of an answer unless something is actually falling over. During the workday, we also, for some of the teams, again, I support about 15 to 20 teams, depending on how you count, we try to keep the, um, the focus or the interrupts to scheduled meeting times, which allows a larger block of time for folks to actually sit down and get their work done. This is completely different to what you might experience in terms of XP or pairing or if you were in a workplace and you, you know, there's a, an expectation that you can just go and tap someone on the shoulder. So think about those keywords for yourself and do you, to really sink your teeth into a problem, do you need to have that quiet time to yourself or do you need to be talking to someone else? So if you think about when I said what brings you joy and you just kind of, you know, many of you just stared at me blankly, but as soon as you got to talk to someone else, then that sort of got the ideas going and you were able to generate through brainstorming what that was. So think about um, those, those words and whether or not you want a high interrupt or a high sort of 
social environment or whether or not you want to sort of narrow down, narrow down the noise and focus it in on specific meeting times. So really the question of which resonates with you? Is it the, the inventor, is it the refactor, or is it the scale? And asking and taking out of those job descriptions as much information as you get, but also interviewing the employer and asking them to tell you what it is that they are expecting from that position. I mean, not at all have I talked about your skills. This is about what brings you sort of joy and, and how you like working and the delight that, that, that you need to have from your employer. So now we've got kind of some lessons from the trenches. Um, I've worked ex almost exclusively on distributed teams since 2006, um, and it, it's hard work. You need to be very consciously involved in the day-to-day um, -day activities of how you're going to work as a distributed team. So it means setting up some kind of schedule. It means, and I, I don't have a picture in here, but we, we have a lot of meetings that are set aside, so that there is intentional time. We don't do the 24-7 video camera of the office space. It's very, even when we do hangouts, we, we tend not to do video. Um, and that's, it's just the way the, the culture of our office works. And it works well for us, but we do have these really intentional times set aside to have that communication. Um, we tend to work on shorter sprints. We tend to... Uh, force people to show how their work is going instead of going the longer two-week sprint. Um, we shorten things down and, and make sure that we explicitly know that someone is doing well or has run into problems. We take turns for being responsible for planning instead of trying to do it as a group because it is quite difficult. And we also allow people wherever possible to self-select the tasks that they're working on. None of this is official policy. It's just what works for the folks who are um, currently within the teams that I work with. The next one, uh, aiming for culture, is aiming too low. So I have had a couple of jobs where I loved the people who I was going to be working with going into the company, and then found that that actually wasn't enough because there wasn't a clear sense of how I could be useful and what the company needed from me. And it was just this constant struggle as we didn't figure out where the click was in terms of the, the, the synergy of how we were going to work together. So when you, when you do start a job, even if you love the people, you love the company, you love the brand, you love everything about them, stop and think about what you're actually going to be doing for the first three or six months and make sure that it's something that you're excited about working on and they are excited about you working on and it's actually going to be helping them either to generate new revenue or smooth out an onboarding process or whatever it happens to be. It can change, it doesn't need to be the same for the whole thing, but make sure you have that plan with them. And then the next one. So this is, this is a tricky one for, for uh, us right now. Um, our team, Digital Services, is responsible for um, helping to bring a new way of thinking about software development uh, to, to our larger division. And we're going from teams with uh, sort of a single developer who, who sits with the team all the time to having more of a central pool and then taking whole teams and giving them to um, to a product owner or to a software product and they would get an intense period of maybe three to six months to build out a new feature set and then they go and work with a different team. So not all developers are going to want to work that way and certainly the, the conditions have changed from a developer being effectively embedded to a developer being more sort of sp like special ops now and that they'll go in and then they'll leave again. They'll go in and then they'll leave again. It's more like agency work and that's not going to suit everyone. So if you know really well how you like to work, if the conditions change at work, you'll be better able to say, it's not quite what I want, so can I meet my needs within a different division, within the company, or you know, depending on how big or how small the company is. But again, the more you're conscious of it, the more you can make um, conscious decisions. That's a little bit redundant, isn't it? <laughs> but you have to understand yourself, and you have to be able to see the work for what it is, and to be able to compare it against what you need. Oh, perhaps uh, in conclusion, your perfect job is out there. I do think that. Um, I, the, like I said, there's challenges to, to every job, but the job that I'm in right now brings me, brings me joy, and I love helping the people that I help. Yes, it has its frustrations, but I'm sure that every job out there will have its frustrations, and I feel, for me, that it's a really meaningful experience, and it's um, similar in the work that I've done for other agencies. I mean, I've worked for not-for-profits, through agencies before, but I really love this in-house aspect that I now have. Know yourself, not just your role. 
understand what it is that you need out of a job to feel that you are working at your best. Consider the pioneer, settler, town planner breakdown. There's lots of other different ways that you can think about it, but it's not necessarily just about sort of a, a Myers-Briggs or a True Colors or those kinds of things. It's sort of thinking about how your role applies to the different phases or life cycle of a product. I work with your team to define and achieve success. And then finally, my slides are online. I think we may have one or two minutes for questions, and I'm hoping that the next presenter will come and boot me off stage. Those are my last set of slides. Um, I should also remind you, contributor sprints are happening on Friday. There's a mentored course sprint in the morning, um, and also the first time sprinter workshop happens first thing. Um, then the general sprint is full day, blah, blah, blah on you should give evaluations for all speakers, not just me, um, but I'll come back to this one. I don't, I, like I said, I don't know if there's questions or not, um, but if you do want to, now you've got that sort of pioneer, settler, town planner, have a chat back with the person that you talked to before and think about with them, which of those three do you think you most fit with? You're not supposed to clap, you're supposed to talk to people. <laughs> yeah, I have one, one question is, um, do you feel that there is a pressure for like the developer to become a manager, the manager to become a director, that sort of pressure how? Yeah, really, really good question. Um, so I think there's, there's effectively uh, become kind of two accepted paths, I guess is the right way to say it. Um, one is for you to specialize within code and become more of an architect, and then the other one is um, to, to go the manager track. And I absolutely think that there is a pressure to do that, and I also think that um, there, so f from my experience, I mean, I started out doing web development, um, and I am now very, very happy as a project manager slash um, development manager. For me, the internet has moved very, very quickly. And especially as a former front-end developer, it just was too, it, it wasn't exciting for me to keep on top of all of the technologies. So I would hope that the workplace that folks are in would recognize that an employee may want to step out of a development role or they may love the development role. They may love the speed, they may love sort of the, the constant sense of change and be able to support someone in staying in that role and not force them into a management role. Uh, and the language that I've seen around that is more around architect, um, senior, it's not even senior engineer. There's another, there's another word that is along the architect line, which is the not management track. Um, so yeah, and I, there's a couple of good articles that sort of separate out the pressures and that sort of thing. I can, I'll dig out the resources and add them to the, the deck. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. I work for a worker cooperative where we all co-own our business. Yep. I noticed you didn't mention that as kind of one of the business models, um, that one of the workplaces you may find yourself in. Um, have you ever worked in a worker-owned business and or would that change your perception of how you can affect the future direction of your own Yep. Uh, type of work and the direction of the company itself. Yeah, I would sort of slot that one into self-employed contractor solopreneur, although it's not the same thing at all. Um, there are at least three or four collectives that I'm aware of within the Drupal space, uh, one being Montreal-based, one being San Francisco-based. I won't remember any of the company names. Uh, and then where are you based out of? Uh, we are Agile Collective, based in Oxford, England. Yep. Um, and just a quick plug. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm, do I'm doing a talk about worker ownership yep. um, and growth and sustainability yep. at 2 p.m. on Thursday. Yep. So it'd be great to absolutely. have a chat before yeah. then and, and compare notes. Yeah. Um, and then the other model, which I didn't include in here, is uh, one where it is uh, sort of owner operated, but it is profit sharing for the employees. And so the employees get to veto um, what clients come in and also how they're going to spend their money in terms of whether or not they're going to go to a conference, what they're going to do with, or do they just want the bonus at the end of the year. So there's, there, like, this is a very, very limited view and yes, there are definitely other ways of, Indeed, it's just, this is, these are the ones that I've worked absolutely, in. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think I might be getting the big hook now. 
Amanda's not shown up. I'm, I'm, I keep waiting for Amanda to show up and be like, get off the stage. <laughs> You're here. Yeah, perfect. There's my big hook. All right. Thanks very much, everyone.